from Burkina Faso and is a native of the Dagara tribe. He is a shaman or high priest, and he has taken on the task of sharing with us the lessons of his indigenous culture, the Dagara nation, uh, in initiation, remembering one's purpose on earth through ritual, wisdom, healing, and community. We sure could use some of that about now, is that right? He says, our mission is connected with the revival of the ancestors' culture and tradition. There is a missing link to our African ancestry that has repercussions on the quality of our lives. Wouldn't y'all agree? Okay. We cannot move forward into the future by abandoning the past. Knowing tradition is everything. He is the author of Water and Spirit and his brand new book, The Healing Wisdom of Africa, Finding Life's Purpose through nature, ritual, and community. This is his first time here, but we trust that it will not be his last. Let us rise and give a United African Movement welcome to Maladoma Somme. Maladoma Somme. Come on, keep it going. Let us welcome. I want to start with a thank to the uh, ancestors, to our great mothers and our great fathers for keeping us together healthy and striving in this white culture. And then I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, this is the first time in traveling around that I get to this place and I feel like I've come home. You'll excuse me, it's a very emotional moment for me because uh, here are brothers and sisters who are really acting like Africans. It is important that we be aware that indeed the mother continent is waiting for us. We are her children, and she knows that at this juncture, where, as I heard earlier, history is dangerously threatening to repeat itself. She's calling on us, and she's asking us to remember. We cannot start another 400 years of suffering. We have already proven that. And it is time for the power of the ancestors to become the hurricane that washes away 
is centuries of suffering. As I stand here, this is the feeling that I have. And with the eyes of an initiate, I can guarantee you that there are many more in this room that you can't see, but they're here. I see some sitting over, the, over there still holding the shackle of slavery, but with a smile on their face. I see others over there with a fist like this, a lot of young faces. And this tells me that what we're doing here is slowly rewriting history. When I was a child, the vision of the world that I had was very rosy. The closest person in my life was my grandfather. He was known in the village as the healer, the great priest. But he himself didn't think of himself as such. All he said was that the ancestors have borrowed his body in order to do some work. In retrospect, what I'm experiencing in this culture is that the ancestors of Africa are begging each one of us to lend them our bodies so that they can do great work. Because the time has come for the digging out of the vast body of knowledge that the continent has produced for the world, knowledge that people are still trying to figure out how it came about. And to know that this is the legacy of our ancestors must give us enough pride to know that abundance is heading our way. Yes. My grandfather told me that uh, I'm supposed to be the, the friend of the enemy. I've never liked that. Because I don't like enemies, period. And in my life in this Babylonian realm, the worst enemy is the one who looks like me. And so all I can say is that uh, I feel very humbled to know that in the middle of the confusion and the chaos, there are some of us who are sensitive to the constant calling of the ancestors, even though they don't know how exactly to go about lending themselves so that the ancestors can do what they know best. And this is what I would like to share tonight ways of bringing the other world of the ancestors into this world, ways of informing the world of the ancestors what it is that our daily lives is witnessing that need their attention and their intervention so that we can live with greater dignity so that we can live with a greater sense of connectedness and purpose. The thing that I learn most among the people of my nation, the Dagara nation, was that every one of us who come into this world come here because we have a purpose to fulfill. 
and that no one in the land of the ancestors is authorized to come here on vacation. And so if that is true, it's not right that so many of us walk down the street wondering why they are here. It's not right to see so many brothers and sisters wasting their life away in the perdition of a white world that rather wish they're not here. What I know about that purpose is that its own power is capable of changing whatever rule anyone put together to serve him or her. And we live in a, in a world where the rules are written by someone else. And we know very well that we don't embrace our own power by following the rules of someone else's wrote because they were written so that we never win. Instead, in order to get where we're supposed to go, we need at least to reach into the world of our ancestors, if only to tell them about the state we are in and our profound desire to get out of this state in order to shine in the world just the same way as we, sh we shown when we were living our true purpose thousands of years ago. I know that uh, this energy is in this room, and I know that this energy will follow each one of us home. Yeah. Above all, I know that this energy will want to dwell in every one of our homes, waiting for us to say, go ahead and make history happen. This is because we have to recognize that we have reached a section in human history where things are moving very fast. We cannot ignore that. The world that is to be tomorrow will feature the African woman and man in a way never seen before. We don't want to miss that rendezvous because we are being called to stand somewhere so that that which used to be at the core of our identity can be seen by the rest of the world. In January, I was in my village and five of my elders and gatekeepers took me to the old place of initiation in nature where there is a big cave. As we stood in front of the cave on the top of a hill, very difficult to climb, the gatekeeper began a prayer in a language which I've never heard before. But afterwards, he said that this language used to be the language of everyone several thousand years ago. And that the people that taught him this language will soon come out of this cave. And lo and behold, in the middle of the cave, as if in the rocky ceiling, seven feet above, a hatch opened. And a little man 
jumped out of there and immediately spoke in Dagara language saying, why did you call me? I stood there in awe as my body felt like it was being hit by an electric wave. And I peeked into the world behind that hatch and realized series, lines and lines of pyramids as if somehow they have been miniaturized and aligned in a nature that felt very inviting. In the face of that sight, I said to myself, this is the power that we African are in touch with. This is the wonder that has been made available to us. How many of us are aware of that? And how can such a powerful occasion be made readily available to every African so that we stop believing that our future is the kind that had already been written by white men. My grandfather, who foretold my own story, was really interested in something. Uh, he said uh, that in order for anyone to survive in a world dominated by another one, you have to understand what is going on in the mind of the other. And that knowing is the beginning of protecting self. I now understand more that indeed there is someone in this modern culture that would rather most of us remain ignorant, uh, remain underinformed, in order to give to give himself a better night's sleep. And this is the reason why it feels to me that there has to be somewhat of a shortcut to getting ourselves out of the darkness and into the light so that we don't have to follow someone else's rules. And this is the reason why it feels like that shortcut has to go through the reinvention of ancestral rituals. It has to go through the recreation of proper radical rites of passage that allow our young children to transit from childhood to adulthood. For our elders to be honored in a way that allow them to function like anchors, giving the rest of us the power to know that we are living for something that is bigger than us, and we are willing to die for that big thing. And so the question is, how do we invent or recreate or even remember these rituals so that we can get on with what we are here to accomplish? We have to have a day of the ancestors, a day in the course of which an altar can be erected right here, the ancestral altar, and where each one of us will have the opportunity to come to that altar and tell the ancestors via one grandmother or mother or father or uncle that just passed about what it is that is challenging his or her life right now. And to say out loud, I just cannot make it by myself. Please help me out. <laughs> the 
they are waiting on the other side for our permission to go to work. Yes. They will not take any initiative without our permission. And this is how powerful we are. And yet we know how much we need in order to be able to live a more dignified life. We cannot go ahead pretending that we have it all when in fact what we think we have it all has been saved away and hidden away so far that we don't even know where, where we put it. And this is why we have to tell the ancestors to go get it for us. That day, when it is possible for this room to become a big shrine room, allowing each and every one to come and tell his or her story to the ancestors, the challenges that you are facing on a daily basis, you will have the chance a week later to see what the ancestors have been, have been able to accomplish in the course of seven days. I suggest that somewhere down the road, this movement drafts every ancestor available so that out there they can contribute to rewriting the socioeconomic rules. We live in a world where it is clearly said that there's not enough for, for everyone. The uh, socioeconomic philosophy of modern day stipulates that indeed there is scarcity. Our ancestors' socioeconomic philosophy used to be that there is enough for everybody. It is that everybody is wealthy and everybody is entitled to enjoyment of abundance. And consequently, as long as we African have not reached that stage when we don't have to worry about a nine to five deal. We don't have to worry about a retirement plan. Uh, as long as we have not reached that stage, we need to continually send an SOS to the other world so that they can intervene. We have to tell them that we have tried every which way in this world to, uh, to, to, to change the rules written by the other in order that the wells held up can spill onto us too. We have to tell them we have tried and we have to recognize that we shouldn't have taken this matter into our own exclusive hands that we should have started by telling them to actually take care of it for us. We just have to say it out loud to them and wait for their answer. And so what I'm saying, and the reason why I'm saying what I'm saying is that uh, this is a family for me. And my understanding of a family is that everybody must be truly happy, not pretense happiness, not this kind of happiness that comes as a paint over too much pain that I can't recognize, uh, too much sorrow, uh, too much scarcity, uh, too much worry, and therefore I utilize brotherhood and sisterhood as an antidote but genuine joy, genuine sense of abundance can indeed trigger this sense of community that uh, we all need in order to re-embrace our true purpose. And so this is what I learned from my elders in the nations of the Dagara people. 
And this is what I have observed in the course of 25 years being in the belly of the beast, uh, trying to figure out how to be. And I've noticed that every time I've tried to, to, to live by the rule written by someone else, I've been hit somehow. And yet every time I have started out by telling the, my ancestors that this is not my world, and yet you call me to do something here, and I want you, if you are to not experience one extra opportunity for being ashamed, uh, you have to make sure that you get me across. I have always found myself across without understanding how it actually happened. We have to be looking for results. And these results can be provided to us in a way that defies logic. And this is going to be the proof of the power of our ancestors. And I know that if the continent we have all left behind to come here is to heal at all, that healing will have to begin with the resurrection of the ancestors right here. <laughs> And I say that because while we are deliberately struggling to embrace our Africanness, too many of our brothers and sisters in the continent are working the opposite direction. And we have passed the time of rhetorical uh, convinced conviction of them. We have passed a time when we can speak sense into their head so that they can come back to the ways of the elders. And therefore, action is what is needed. We have to allow these ancestors to show us how to get from point A to point B without having to hitchhike on the back of someone who looks like he has already made it. And so the real source of our power is there. And this is why this ritual to the ancestors that I'm suggesting is something that uh, should become the starting point of a whole series of others that allow gathering of this nature to look like it wants to focus on the very deep problems that we are facing as a people and which we are trying to eradicate or to heal from, to try to eliminate or to prevent our enemies from looking like us. Uh, so that at least uh, we know how to live together under an umbrella that is trustworthy. In my village, all the villagers are, are divided into five different categories. We refer to themselves as fire, water, earth, nature, and mineral. Why? Simply because of this whole idea that they have that no one comes into this world without a purpose. And your, everyone's purpose fits within these five categories, elemental realities that have been around forever, that have helped major scientific breakthrough that the current modern science is still struggling to figure out. I cannot begin to tell you all these things that I have seen done by my own people, which if they were to be transplanted in the modern world, would constitute major technological breakthrough. 
except that they are not interested in competition. There is some sense in which when you have true power at hand, you have no interest in parading around to show. Any person who is parading power is actually trying to hide tremendous anxiety inside. That is to say that really the true power that we need to seek will have to come from within us. And this is the power of the ground. And I know that in this room, they are the water people, the ones who are understood in my nation as the peacemaker, the, uh, the reconciler, but also the one that show how a community can flow smoothly, accepting and honoring everyone. I was so touched by all this honoring and recognizing and thanking and hugging that occurred in this room in the period of a short time. That has the capacity of attracting a lot of spirit into this room. The world out there is starving for acknowledgement, for honoring, for touch. That we come here to give that to each other is the beginning of our true healing. But we also need the fire people in this room. And those fire people will be the visionaries, those who have the capacity of functioning at the edge between the ancestors' world and the village. These are our dreamers. The one who dreams of what is to come. The one who dreams of what is going on. And they are also our diviners. Because in my village, fire is associated with the ancestors. And a fire person is indeed the messenger of the ancestors. That person dreams a whole lot. And then we have those earth people who are the one that makes everyone comfortable, the one that gives a home, care for, and appreciate everyone. If you know of yourself as constantly wanting to accommodate everybody, you are an earth person. And in my village, every time I go home, I'm greeted by an earth representative. And they, they are the ones that bring the water of welcome uh, before I can greet anybody. It's very sweet. And I wish that some days the earth people can be identified in this room so that every week when you come here, they stand at the door welcoming everyone uh, into this room. I look at this table here. And it's a representation of earth. On this, on this table is a representation of abundance. An earth person must have done that. It makes sense. And then the next one is the, the mineral people who are the memory of the village. They are the one that constantly reminds us of the thing that we cannot afford to forget. And so we need some people in this room with this ability to constantly bug us about that which we cannot afford to forget. And there are those who will be noticing everything that is going on and therefore bringing those things up the moment it feels as if the village is going the other direction. And finally, the nature people will be the witches. Every village needs to have its own witches. 
people with the capacity to transform, to produce change, profound change, people with the kind of medicine that produces this inner transformation in everyone. And you know who you are. You can come forward. And if that is, that is to be put in the service of a community, this will work. And it will be great that if there has to be a day of the ancestors where prayers and communication are delivered to the hand of the ancestors, let it be done by elemental group. That the fire people show up and speak their truths to the ancestors then allowing the water people to come and speak their truth, and then the earth people, and then the mineral people, and then the witches. You know, I'm saying this because there is a tendency to believe that all these spiritual values are kind of spooky or mumbo jumbo. Uh, Sometime I, I hear in the media uh, about uh, voodoo something. Uh, and I wonder, the person who uses this kind of word, does he really understand what he's talking about? And what I realize is that, you know, sometime the rejection or the, the, the downgrading of a, of a reality is hiding the person's fear about truly understanding what that means. Because if we get to understand the true meaning, it will frighten. When Europe came to Africa, one of, one of my elders said that it came looking for healing because it, it was already at odd with its own ancestors. And what happened is that following its tradition of separating with the ancestors, it missed the healing it came seeking and instead proceeded in a systematic pillage of the whole continent. What it did not see, however, is a true source of African power because that is invisible. And after having taken that which is visible, it has developed a propaganda that only portrays the continents as a place of all evil. You know, there is uh, indeed an African saying that uh, be careful when a naked person offers you a shirt. Uh, uh, and there are indeed a lot of, a lot of talk about AIDS, economic AIDS, uh, assistance. But behind this assistance, we should wonder what is standing there. What naked person is offering a shirt to Africa? Uh, it is important, perhaps, that we realize per, that this can only be seen in a context in which we have reunited with our ancestors in a way that uh, give no doubts about the source of our true power. And when you know that, you can also tell the true meaning of a gift that is coming from a person who is, whose soul is starving and is dying right in front of you. See, the dollar bill is not symbol of, abund of, a, of abundance. It is in fact symbol of scarcity. If we're looking for abundance, we have to look at somewhere else. Then the dollar bill starvation for abundance will seek our homes. 
because that's where it's going to find its ultimate fulfillment. And I know that if it is possible for tomorrow to become or to witness the fulfillment of this true African power, which I notice every time I go to my village, we are going to start here with something that feels like a spiritual exodus. And this exodus must take us into the depth of what constitutes true African rituals, where we rip open our heart and our soul and place it at the shrine of our ancestors for the kind of repair that needs to take place. And so this is a message I want to uh, to deliver tonight and to exhort everyone involved that this Ancestors Day must happen not only once but time and again, allowing our community, our family to experience a true sense of abundance, to experience a true sense of power and more importantly, to give our children a better perspective of what is waiting for them in the near future. Last year in my village, I was told that it won't be long before other children of Africa begins to come home massively. I did not know what that mean, but I believe that tonight, sitting here in front and watching everything that was going on, it seemed to me that I'm beginning to understand. We are going to Africa. I still don't know how or why. But what I know is that this continent is waiting for us to come home. And it is not the kind of thing that must be thought of logically, but more spiritually, more uh, ritualistically. Because we have to stop thinking where ritual intervenes. The, the whole idea of dual citizenship that I heard earlier on, the whole idea of places being made available for everyone that want to visit to come over, made me think of this kind of spiritual exodus that is going to take care not just of dual citizenship, but of a plain African citizenship. <laughs> and when I say that, well, all I'm saying is that uh, we've got to remember the way the continent is divided was not African. Someone else did it that way. And I believe it's up to us to remake Africa what it truly is. And for me, this is my understanding of the United African Movement. It has to lead to a united Africa. And that's why I believe that whoever had this idea was being hired by the ancestors on a job that he or she cannot fire himself from. <laughs> on a job that he or she will never retire from. Because Africa must be whole again. 
I'll be glad when I go back to my home country in two weeks to report on this event here. To me, it is historical. And what I have seen is a testimony to the fact that what the elders have been saying all along for the past 15 years was actually taking shape in a small way, but in a steady and growing way. And we have come to a place where we have then to put the United African Movement into the hands of the ancestors that inspired you to create it to begin with. And by doing that, history can begin to go faster. I don't have much else to say. Uh, I can only stress the fact that my heart is throbbing uh, because I feel like home is near. And I feel the presence of these ancestors who seem to be vibrating as if they have been waiting for this moment. Uh, and indeed, all I can hope for is that this does not become a redundant gathering uh, that leads nowhere, but one that commit everyone to dive deeper into your fear, your fear of what might happen if anything changes, so that eventually, the veil that is separating us from the other world can become so scared that it tears itself away, liberating us once and for all. If we have to move, we must move. And so, again, I want to thank you from the depths of my heart for allowing me to partake in this day. I believe that indeed, Africa live well in the heart of America. And I really appreciate you. Thank you. and answer so we'd like everyone to just hold their seats just about maybe 15 minutes or so of question and answer uh, minister brown has set up a microphone uh, in the middle of the aisle and if we can have um, just a few minutes of uh, some brief questions. Yes, come forward. That's fine. Sister Latrella Thornton. Let's give her a hand. Okay. Right. Hotep, um, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. I read your book and your wife's book, mm. and I'm waiting to purchase your next, your this book. Um, A few years ago, a very important person in our community who lived in South Carolina A few years ago, a brother by the name of Mr. Felt Middleton, who was a very important person in our community, made a transition to the ancestors. And um, he passed on a Sunday. 
And the spirit came to me the next day. And he spoke to me and said it was very dark. And he was very frightened. And I said, well, what should I do? And he said, go out and get a candle and burn a candle. So I ran out, bought a candle, lit a candle, called my friends, told them to do the same thing. A few days later, he came back to me and said he felt better. And we communicated in this way. And he said that many of our ancestors are stuck because we are not doing the rituals anymore. That um, they are there and they're waiting and they can't move on because it's a reciprocal relationship that we have to help them as they help us. And because we aren't doing the rituals, they can't move on. So I've been, I mean, I've been running around telling folks we need to do ritual, ritual, ritual. I'm waiting because, and I, I, I'm with the ancestors all day long, every day, 24 hours, seven, seven. And, and I'm pulling for rituals to come down for the, because I know the ritual must be done with community because that's how we go forward. And I'm, I'm here for you tonight because I want you to pull f for us some rituals that we can do. Um, and and I, I know that as you say, that they're here with us now because their presence is always with us. We have to just know that. But I'm asking them within your presence to give us some rituals that we can do because we're ready to do some rituals. With, with their help, we can. And um, can you now at least give us one little simple ritual? I mean, we do rituals all the time. I mean, but I mean, consciously as a community, doing a ritual with a purpose to bring the energy down and to open the veil up, as you say. Okay. Thank you. Uh, brother. Uh, oh. Well, the, oh, you can plug it in. Okay. Well, the, uh, the ritual you're talking about, indeed, is, uh, is a very, very pressing one. I mean, the ritual ans uh, for the ancestors. So many of our brothers and sisters who have passed are still waiting for us to give them the kind of energy that only us can give to them so that they can start to become more active in our life. And so one of the, one of the simplest thing that uh, every one of us here can do personally first is a small little altar to the ancestors in your home. Bring something in there, put it there, you represent the ancestors. That representation alone is the beginning of a long relationship. Keep a candle burning there all the time. We are blessed with a lot of candles around uh, that we use, most of them uselessly. Uh, it is important to at least uh, bring that light to them for a number of days before you begin communicating to them. Because that light translates on the other side as a pathway to the place of empowerment that allow them to then begin to listen to what we have to say. At a communal level, you will have to come here first and a ritual honoring the ancestors will have to begin with each one being given a tiny little candle that you would light and call on the name of an ancestor, someone, a brother, a sister, an uncle that has passed, and place that on an altar. So that by, by the time everyone has done it, you will have a table that is all lit with countless candles. That's the, it is not any more complicated than that. Uh, after you've done that, then the day of the ancestor where each one of you can come forth to communicate the challenges that are facing you in your life will have a deeper significance. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, 
I've uh, I've seen the Holy Ghost. I've seen Jesus Christ and God. Jesus is the mediator for God. He said, go tell us about me and thou shalt receive a reward. I was dis disturbed about racism and Jesus Christ and God came to me after a traumatic prayer in the prior days of my life. Um, they say that the end of the world will be in 2001 or 2000. Um, do you believe this is true? And uh, about an altar in your house, would incense be sufficient? If the, if the end of the world is that close, uh, if the end of the world is that close, we know who the big losers are going to be. Uh, All right. There are those who have accumulated too much wealth to which they're so attached that uh, the end of the world is going to be a disaster. Something has to end in this world. And as, far as, and as far as ending is concerned, I think it's long overdue. Uh, uh, and so whether it is the end of the world or the end of this kind of gluttony that uh, is uh, crippling our communities, our society, we will celebrate that ending. Uh, And that can constitute the advent of the glory of God. That finally, that which was being held away from us will be taken away and brought home to us. We have waited long enough. We have suffered long enough. Hundreds and hundreds of years, they speak loud enough. So let the world end. a proper altar to your ancestors. Incense. Incense is good. All right. Um, yes, I read your book. Um, in your book, um, your um, father and your grandfather were like witch doctors, and they seemed to do um, like a lot of things, like magical things. And I want to know if, if people in Africa could do those things, and if we built pyramids, how could slavery happen? How come Arabs, Christians just come into Africa and enslave us? I always wondered about this. You know, I read your book, and you know, I always, why, are we, why are we in the condition we are today? Like, you have homeless people, you know, a lot of us have AIDS, and you know, it's like, you know, why are all these things happening to us if, you know? <laughs> There are, many, there are many things about the ways of the ancestors that are hard to understand from a logical standpoint. Of course, you cannot put together a straight line between this kind of power and exactly what subsequent history has demonstrated. Because obviously, what does it mean to be enslaved? What does it mean to be a third world? What does it mean to, be, uh, uh, to, to live below poverty in light of the kind of power that I talk about? What it shows in the logical modern thinking is that that's not true. 
You cannot have this power and allow yourself to be enslaved. You cannot have this kind of power and be poor. Well, I got news. The true source of power, as I've come to understand it, is hidden in a It is illogical. I don't like it. But I am here today, standing here in front of you, after years and years and years of suffering. And I know that uh, growing up, to be able to open up your consciousness, you have to begin with an experience of what we call radical initiation. What I've come to understand finally is that we African people have spread all across the, the world and undergone the kind of initiation that no one else can undergo. Yeah. And the initiation is now over. What is left is the homecoming. Let's, that's why the world will end. Okay, my name, my name is, I'm known as Sister Sakia, but my name, my chief name is Nana Atta Nkum I. I'm an, an Akobia Henny chief in Ghana. I went through radical initiation by my ancestors when I visit Mother Imakus in um, Ghana in 94 and in 95 of January, I was installed, placed on a stool that had went unoccupied 350 years in the village of Asankrua because that last chief that was stolen from Ghana and brought to America or brought to the West, the eldest said no one would sit there until the right person from across the ocean would come. So I'm blessed that it was me. It's a male stool. I'm also a woman. So I give thanks to the ancestors for that. I also went underneath a second radical initiation when I went back to Mother Amakosa's house, which I'm so glad she's here tonight in America visiting us here. And I, was, I slept in the tent, and her place overlooks the ocean. And I slept in the tent there for seven days and seven nights. I was in this tent in the yard listening to Yemiya. And I was told to pick up the drum and to start playing. Now, this is the question. <laughs> it has to do with women and drumming. There is this thing uh, that goes on, a prejudice. I call it a prejudice against women drumming. But the ancestors are telling me to pick up the drums. We know that there's more women in this world than there are men. We know that lots of our men are incarcerated. Wars take away our men. And at this time, even as a chief, I'm really not supposed to be playing the drums, but this is something the ancestors told me I must do. So I'm asking you, as an initiated, as a priest, will we be seeing more women doing the sacred drumming coming into the time, am I in sync with what I've been doing so far? That's what I need to know. Because brothers say, well, you can't play with the drum in between your legs. But if I bring forth a child from between my legs, and if a man comes from and lays with me, it should be a sacred, sacred thing as well. So I just want to know, am I in sync? <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, let me say, you are not insane. You're only following orders. At this point, at this point in our in our history, we are being asked to exercise as much uh, flexibility as possible. Uh, rigidity is not going to help us move forward, and. Uh, it has come to a point where the urgency of the revival of ritual is so important that gender cannot be an issue. The 
Good evening. I've read your book and I'm very honored to be here, to be in your presence. Because when I started reading that book, I couldn't put it down. It was so powerful and the feeling for me was African people are so powerful. We are not using half of our power, not even one tenth of our power. And it's very necessary that we do that. Um, in New York City, there is an African burial ground. Um, there's been research, DNA done on the remains of, of the people. I don't know how much you know about it, but they're about on about four, 40 bodies. Um, they found out that some of the people were Tureg, some were from Senegal, Nigeria, um, Ghana, Senegal, I think I mentioned Senegal, and now the government is reneging on, on what they had promised to do because of the fear, I think, of how powerful this has gotten. Now, several of us have decided to go there and do, um, we did some ceremonies last week, but we're going to do some new moon ceremonies on actual burial ground um, place, you know, spot. Now, you mentioned the ceremonies with the candles. Is there anything we can do? Because from my knowledge, I know if you can do ceremonies actually where the ancestors lay, it is more powerful. Well, this is a very, it's a very important thing because it distinguishes uh, those ritual that you can do in a place like this, as opposed to this ritual that you have to do on site. And what I have to suggest is two things, ash and food. They must be nourished. These ancestors must be fed. However, you have to cook the food on the spot and serve the ancestors. And then you will only eat that food after the ancestors have been fed. How you do that exactly, you start with circling the entire ground with white ash. The ash you get from burning wood, that white thing. Circle it all. And you have to line up together, form a circle, and each one of you has a length of five feet of ash to lay. And uh, it becomes a round circle that uh, protects that place. The food must be cooked inside there. This is the ancestral meal that you're preparing. And during all that time, sing. Sing to the ancestors, sing to them. If you remember name, call them in. At the end, they only serve in the evening. And the food must stay there overnight. And then you would have done what you needed to do. It is, it is a simple, it's as simple as that. But it's a good question that you ask how to do it on the spot. Everyone must bring the utensil, contribute some, uh, some condiments, some food, so that it is not a one person's initiative. A community must go offer abundance to another community. That's the idea. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just let me ask you for a little clarification on that. Cemeteries are very huge. I mean, if other people wanted to do that, do you circle just the 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 site of your relative or the person you're doing? That's right. You can do that. Okay. They're very generous on the other side. They share just about everything together. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is not a problem. <clears throat> I have read your book about four or five times, and every time. It has been a profound initiation because I approached it in that spirit. You yourself, sir, at the last page, coming to the end of your page, you divined along with Goose, if I remember his name correctly, your maternal uncle, I think, whatever it is, I can't remember the exact word. You divined, and there he told you against your own inner feelings that you must go to America to be swallowed up in the white man's. 
He challenged you to produce your own divination mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you checked with him, you saw that he was talking the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, sir, if it is possible in the future for you at some time, however the ancestors will work it out, I don't know, that's their job. For you to come and give us a sort of seminar whereby you can divine the duty, the spiritual duty that each of us must have in the same way that goes to divine yours against your own will and show that you must travel. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very good question. Very good question. This is very good question. Yeah. Uh, it has a very short answer. Uh, it is yes. Uh, you know why? You know, we're into this together. This is not me against you. It's not you and me. We are now embarked in a very long exodus heading home. And uh, when I said earlier on, that I felt like I've come home. I've come home to stay. And so I know from the depths of my heart that I will not only be coming back here, but I will be bugging you. <laughs> yeah. Good evening and uh, welcome, brother. Uh, I read your book, then I lost it, didn't finish it. Picked it up, read it again, got through a few pages, and uh, it's a struggle. Uh, you know, no disrespect, but I, you know, this is, a, it's a hard for me to grasp the spiritual aspect. Your power is undeniable, and this people's power is undeniable here, all praise to these